All right, we have finally reached the last part of the team project, writing instructions. So as with everything that we do in writing, we want to begin by taking note of the rhetorical situation. When you're designing your written instructions, you want to be asking, what are your readers' expectations? For example, um, if you have a simple product, product like a light switch or a light switch cover or something like that, the readers are going to expect to find the instructions right on the packaging. But if you have something like a, um, a fancy TV or um, some like flat pack furniture or something, your readers are going to expect a separate instruction manual. So thinking about what your readers' expectations are can help you with designing your, um, your actual document and where you're going to place that document. Um, you also want to talk about or think about what are your readers' abilities. If you're creating, um, you know, instructions for using some high-tech piece of equipment, um, you might want to think about the language barriers, for example. Uh, the sets of the, the terminology that you use. Um, if you were creating an instructional video, you would need to be thinking about providing captions for hearing impaired or, um, you know, maybe some, um, like an, an actual transcript of the video. So thinking about the reader's abilities, thinking about what they need in order to be able to use the instructions is very important before you ever begin. Um, do you need to create more than one set of instructions for different audiences? Maybe that's something to consider. Think about a lot of products nowadays. Um, there are not only the actual you know, instruction manual um, in whatever form that takes in with the product itself, but there are also often QR codes that take you to video instructions, um, that take you to uh, troubleshooting guides and things like that. So that's something that you would want to think about. Do you need to create more than one set of instructions for different audiences? Now for this particular project, the minimum requirement is one set of instructions, but it might be a good idea for you to think about would you in the real world need more than one set and maybe make a note of that, you know, if we were doing this for real, we would also include instructions in these other formats. What languages should you use? Do you have a primarily English speaking audience that you should only use English for? Or as most things in the US today, you know, should they be bi or trilingual, including Spanish and French as well? Um, or are you going for a more multinational audience where you should have instructions in several different languages? Um, now, unless you happen to speak and write fluently some of these other languages, I'm not expecting you to do anything except in English for this because this is an English language class. Um, but if you happen to include other languages, that would be a bonus. Um, or you could just make notes again about, you know, if we were doing this for real in the real world, we would also include um, these other languages for this reason, whatever that reasoning is. Um, will readers be anxious about the information? That's a really, um, a really interesting question to consider. And we don't often often think about that, but think about the intimidation factors. Is this going to be intimidating information for some of your audience? Um, if the information is going to be somewhat intimidating, make sure that the design isn't. Break it down into small pieces, 
make it visually appealing and so that it doesn't look overwhelming. Um, so lots of white spaces, lots of graphics, large type, narrow text columns, um, so that each page would have just a small amount of information. And that makes it less overwhelming and easier to digest and work step by step. Um, and then will the environment in which the instructions are read affect the document design? So if people are going to be using these instructions outdoors, for example, you might want to have um, some special paper that would tolerate moisture or dirt or something like that. Um, if they're going to be in like small enclosed areas, like a closet where they've, you've got plumbing access or something, just thinking in my own house, there's a closet with no lighting where there's plumbing access. Um, you know, you might wanna have the, the papers kind of in a smaller size and allowing you to see what you need to see, like little steps on each page um, one at a time so that, you know, you can kind of look at um, little bits in that smaller space. And then, you know, perhaps there's a lot of space um, that might be lending itself well to a, like full on posters and maybe several of them where people can really have it laid out. Um, you know, so thinking about those things um, are very important when you're getting ready to write your written instructions. And also we have the document that you've been using for your team product or project. I think if you go down to about page five, yeah. Down here, we're on page five, I believe. Um, you will see the breakdown for the instructions for use, your purpose your audience and your content. Remember your audiences are the general consumers of your product. So they are not going to be the techies with all of the, the technical information, avoid the jargon. Um, so we have the required components for content and style and design here. And these are due Thursday. So please make sure you have a look at those so that you know the breakdown of what's expected. So once you do have a handle on your rhetorical situation, then you can start thinking about content and what goes into that. One guiding principle here, good instructions are unambiguous, understandable, complete, consistent, and efficient. There are four basic parts to an instruction manual, instruction guide, whatever you want to call it. Um, you have the title, you have the general introduction, and in this case, the introduction is going to include the description of your product or service, step-by-step -step instructions, and conclusion. The title should be something like how to XYZ. It should not be instructions for using blah, blah, blah. Although it could be using product X, um, but you don't want a string of nouns and you don't want it to be ambiguous. So you want it to be specific and you want it to be active, how to do this or doing this. Um, and then after you have your title, your main part in the beginning will be your introduction. So when you're writing your introduction, you wanna be thinking about these questions. Who should carry out this task? Why should the reader carry out the task? When should the reader carry out the task? What safety matters or other concerns should the reader understand? What items will the reader need and how long will the task take? And these things along with your description will make up your introduction. Um, you don't want to simply bullet point answer those questions. You want to craft an introduction that takes into account those pieces of, of information. And then when you do go get to your step-by-step -step instruction part, you wanna make sure that you number the instructions um, and you be consistent in your numbering. So if you have number one, 
and you have sub point one, sub point two, or sub point A, sub point B, uh, be consistent in that formatting as you go. Present the right amount of information in each step. The right amount of information is one task, only one task per step, right? Use the imperative mood. Imperative mood is the commands. Do this, do that, press this, hammer that, like pound that, whatever. Do not uh, make the mistake of saying something like, um, at this point, the blue pin should be inserted into the red notch. You have way too many words there and it's just, it gets ambiguous, especially when you have a whole bunch of instructions like that. You wanna be specific, insert the blue pin into the red notch. Right. So using that imperative mood. Do not confuse steps and feedback statements. You know, insert the USB into the port um, is, is the, the step. A feedback statement would be um, the, the software will begin to install. That, that is not what the user is doing. That's not what the reader is doing. That is something else that's happening as a result. Stick to the steps. If you want to include the feedback statements, do those as kind of sub points, extra information. Don't make them part of the main step. Include graphics. Include graphics that are suitable and graphics that are clearly linked to the text. And then do not omit articles such as A, N, and B to save space. I mean, that can start getting rather confusing if you if you have um, if you have something like uh, <coughs> excuse me if you have something like locate the draw line that's um, that's more specific like the draw line the draw line is a thing um, but if you say locate midpoint and draw line and you don't have your articles a and or the in there locate the midpoint and the draw line or draw a line locate a midpoint because there might be more than one midpoint depending on what you're looking at so if you leave out those articles by saying locate locate midpoint and draw line the reader doesn't really know what you want them to do. So that one that we started with, locate the draw line, you've got the, the article the right there. We know that we're talking about a specific thing, a draw line versus an action, draw the line or draw a line. Okay, so don't don't think you're gonna don't think you're going to be clear by omitting articles to save space because they're just going to create more confusion. Right. And then you will have a conclusion that indicates that the task is done. And if there's any you know, tips or anything, um, any troubleshooting guide, you may include those as well. Um, so here is an example of a concluding statement now that you have replaced the glass and applied the glazing compound, let the window sit for at least five days so that the glazing can cure, then prime and paint the window. So now we know we have replaced the glass and applied the, gra the glazing compound. So that, that was our task, was, was doing that, that replacement and applying the the compound, we know that we're done with that. And we know that we need to wait five days before going on to the next task. Okay. Um, and then you, you might, again, if, there's any, if there are any maintenance tips that you need to leave for your users, your consumers, um, and if there's a troubleshooting guide that you need to include, um, you could do those as well. So when it comes to design, 
again, once you know who your audience is and you know what their needs are, you have an idea of where to begin with your design. You need to also understand what are the actual tasks that your users need to perform um, and how many steps or what are the steps involved in each one. So it would be a really smart idea to go ahead and just make a list of all the tasks and the steps involved in each task. For our purposes, we're going to use a task approach for these instructions, but there are occasions where a tool approach might be more appropriate. Um, I don't believe that applies to any of the groups that we have um, in this, this uh, class right now. So we're going with the task approach, which is the ordered steps, do this, then do this, then do this, then do this kind of thing. Um, when you're getting ready to actually create the document design itself, you want to group your tasks. And some of the common groupings could be things like unpacking or setup, installing, customizing, operating, maintenance, troubleshooting. Um, you know, so those headings might not apply to you, but thinking about them in those terms might help you to decide what headings are best for you to use the groupings for your tasks so that you can create useful headings. Um, and then your graphics, you want to create or choose, find um, helpful graphics such as diagrams, charts, pictures of steps. Um, things need to be labeled. They need to relate clearly to the text. So if you know your tasks and the steps, it's much easier to create the graphics or find the graphics that you need if you're not up to creating them yourself, which most people aren't. Um, I know a few of you are though. <laughs> and then when you, you've got all of this information gathered, you can decide on your headings, you can decide what lists you need, what special notices you need, and you can make sure that you account for white space. So we're going to look at some page examples um, just for a few moments, and then you can on your own look at them more closely. This one I know is very blurry. It's blurry in the source that I got it from as well. That's, that's fine. You don't actually need to read anything on these. What you need to do is you need to notice that the one on the left is very cluttered and confusing, and the one on the right is much clearer much more inviting, and it would inspire much more confidence in the person trying to follow the instructions. But why is that? The one on the left, like we said, is cluttered. There is text crammed into small spaces. There are tons of graphics, um, and it's hard to tell if this is like part of the graphic or if this is something in the background, another photo. Um, because of the way the text is laid out, we're not exactly sure how each graphic lines up with the text. Um, it's, it's just, yes, we know we can go from one line to the next for following instructions, but it, there's just a lot on this page and there's, there's really too much. And um, I don't know how anyone would really feel confident in going through all of this text and trying to put something together. Like it looks like we're building this uh, wardrobe closet sort of thing. Um, I, I don't know, you know, that I would feel comfortable and I put a lot of furniture together. Um, this one, it looks like we're assembling something as well. We can see that it's assembly instructions. There's a lot of white space. And it is very clear what image goes with what text. There is a lot of text, but it's not too much. And it's broken up into smaller sections. And each section is divided by a white space. So we've got a lot clearer, um, calmer page here. And step one, step two, step three, everything is labeled out just fine. We have this, you know, we're using this, this part um, and it is shown to us here so that we can make sure we get the right one. Um, we've got different angles going on here with things. So it's just a much more attractive and usable design. When you are designing your instructions, 
this should be more of a model for you than this. If safety is um, a concern for your product, um, then these are some things that you will want to keep in mind. Uh, we have some signal words and what they uh, what they convey to readers. You know, we start danger is kind of the, the strongest of the, the signal words and then warning is, is also pretty strong, but not quite as strong as danger. Caution is a little bit less than warning. And then note is just kind of a tip or a suggestion. Um, it's not something that we, we feel a sense of impending doom like we might with danger. Um, notice that uh, you know danger and warning often are accompanied by text in all caps. But by the time you get to caution and note, you're, you're more back to regular text um, with you know, upper and lower case. So I, you know, if you're going to include safety information and really if, if safety is ever an issue in any of your products, I mean, that is your primary um, responsibility or primary concern is to make sure that you provide all of the safety information that your users will need before they need it. Um, safety information should come at the beginning of your step-by-step, -step, like before you actually get into the steps, and it should be placed where you need it as well. So before users need it, it should be in the beginning and as they need it in each step. You do not want to let, um, let any safety information slide under the radar. Here's a typical safety label, and we can see that this label here um, is consistent with ISO standards, which is the international use, um, international safety. Um, so it uses just the icon. It does not use any words because that makes it accessible to um, multiple languages. And then this one is more of the ANSI approach, um, which is just in English and is for English speakers. Um, usually you will see them side by side. You will see them together. You won't see a separate, a separate label like this or a separate label like this. You'll see them combined just like this one. This is one label right here. Um, all right. Uh, so here is um, an example from the real world here. And uh, you have four different labels, A, B, C, and D. And you have the industry standard for where these labels should appear on the conveyor belt. So A, B, A should go here as well. So two A's, you've got D here and you've got C here. So each label has its own purpose and each label has its own placement um, guidelines. Uh, so this is, this is an industry standard for um, these conveyor belts. All right, here I'm going to let you on your own go through and read the annotations here, um, but this is just an example from an instruction page and you can, you can go and read the annotations about this. Um, but I will point out that this page is nice in that there's a lot of white space, that the text is not in large chunks. Where there would be a larger chunk, you've got bullet points listed for um, different things. And you've got numbered uh, steps right here, which is really nice. And you've got a drawing down here which is really nice as well um, because it is located close to where you need that information. Good instructions will have materials lists and they should be early on you know, in the instruction document. Um, I like that they have the images, just the, just the basic drawings. They're not fancy or anything, but they are very clear drawings of the parts um, so that you know anyone can match up the item with the part right there. Um, 
and the more materials here, and the parts that are included, uh, the reminder to remove the shipping materials, the safety information, like this is all in the very beginning, preparing to install, and it's laid out very nicely. Um, the one thing that might be a little bit too much is the way the safety is all um, words and wondering if, if maybe there would be room for um, some sort of an image there, but, but if the rest of the instructions include the safety image in the step-by-step -step sections, then um, you know, they're gonna be paired up with the right text and images as well. And here's some more health and safety information, another example of that. So just reading through these annotations would be a good idea. And you can see that this one uses those signal words um, and the word important, and it has you know, various uses for them. Okay. And here, finally, I think this is the last one, we have the troubleshooting guide example. So this is just um, for a, a mower, uh, an example of you know, what might happen. You know, here's, here's the problem, here's what might be the cause, and here's what you should do to address each of those causes and hopefully get your mower working again. All right, now I said that a while back when you started with writing your, your product description, that was before you'd really gotten into the project much. Um, and I said that I would give you some feedback, you'd have a chance to revise that description. Um, you need to do that because you, you're going to include that in your instructions. So, here is a little kind of guide checklist sort of thing for reconsidering your description. Um, you should use this along with any feedback I left on your description document. So make sure that you have addressed these questions. What is the item? Uh, what does the item look like? What's the item's function? How does it work? What are the principal parts? Is there a graphic identifying the principal parts and is that graphic clearly connected to the text? So I will say that some of them, when I saw the graphics, they were like on a completely different page. And I did not ask you to do any real page design for your description. So don't take this as a negative, but right now what you wanna do, because we, we are talking about page design here, is you do want to try to incorporate your graphic into your text in the, the appropriate place. Um, and so you might need to do some, um, some design on your pages. You may decide that using uh, Google Docs is not the best way to do that. You may decide that you need to go, you know, and maybe use a Google slide where you can do more design work. Or maybe you want to go and use Canva um, which was recommended as one of your resources in last week's information about your uh, pitch presentations. So, you know, Canva might be a good option for um, putting together your instruction guide um, because you have so many different ways you can lay out um, pages and, and move things around on those. Um, so that might be an option for you. There may be other options what I do ask is that if you do use something that's not already a Google product, like Google Slides or Docs or something, that you do save your work as a PDF and put that PDF in your team folder. And if you need help um, with how to do that, let me know because I can help you with that. It's really simple. Um, most of the time, every once in a while, something glitches, but most of the time it's very simple and I can easily help you with that. Um, yeah, so just think about how you wanna do this and you, you need to work on this quickly because this is due um, by noon on Thursday. Um, if you run into trouble with that, you need to talk to me sooner rather than later, but the due date is noon Thursday for your 
your completed instruction document and it needs to be in the team project folder. So again, if you have trouble um, because you've used some other method to create your, your instruction guide, um, let me know so I can help you get that um, uploaded into your document or into your folder. And little bonus for those of you who are watching, um, in honor of Independence Day and a belated Juneteenth observance, which GRCC did not instruct us to observe this year, I think because it's a brand new federal holiday, um, I'm wondering if they'll have that included in the calendar for next year, but we are not going to have any work after Thursday until we get back on Tuesday because the fourth is Monday, which is a federal holiday, um, which I actually don't even know for sure if GRCC is technically observing or not, but we are in this class because you all have done a lot of um, intense work on this project for the last few weeks. And so you're going to have just a little mini midterm break, um, basically a Friday and a Monday and your weekend. So um, I will be posting the new stuff um, Monday night or Tuesday, early Tuesday morning for you. Um, and you'll be continuing on um, in an, a more independent manner for the rest of the semester. There may be some group exercises that come up like we were doing very early on in the semester where you'd have to work on something as a group that would help them prepare you for the independent work for the rest of the week. Um, but most of what you're going to be doing is independent work. And um, right now, unless I change my mind between now and uh, next week, uh, the, we're going to be working on um, getting your professional websites started. Um, we'll be <clears throat> working on the website along with other projects for basically the rest of the semester. So you'll be creating this website and adding things to it as we do them in class um, to show your professional skills in related relation to technical writing. If you have any questions or any concerns, please let me know as soon as you can. Um, yeah, that's all we've got.